Recording is on. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thanks everyone for um, attending this. Um, this is a fairly long presentation, so um, what I would suggest is that feel free to just interrupt me and ask questions if anything is is not clear. Um, otherwise, I'll be talking and talking and talking. Um, let me see if I should. Let me see if I should do. If I do a full screen, I will not see your the any text or anything. But I assume you can just use audio to uh, make comments. So, is, does everybody see my screen correctly? Yep. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, so, um, so my name is Wasim Jabi. Uh, I am uh, a the director of the MSc in Computational Methods in, in Architecture at the World School of Architecture at Cardiff University. So today I'm gonna talk to you about Topologic, and Topologic is a piece of software that is the result of a, a fairly large uh, research project that took uh, three years and uh, 300,000 uh, British pounds to, to kind of complete. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that. Um, but first, I need to introduce the team. Um, uh, I worked on this project, on a research project with Robert H. Some of you might know him. He was the person who led the team that invented the uh, generative components at Bentley, then went to Autodesk uh, many years ago and uh, worked under the radar for about three years and then invented Design Script, which is now the language that uh, underlies um, the scripting components in Dynamo. And then when Design, Design Script actually used to work with AutoCAD first. And then uh, when Autodesk decided to put Design Script inside Dynamo and in, kind of like by, by Ian Keel's uh, Dynamo kind of software, um, Robert kind of and Autodesk, I think, parted ways and he left uh, Autodesk and became a professor at the Bartlett, uh, the School of Architecture at, at uh, UCL in London. Now, when he was at uh, Autodesk, uh, let me first, before I tell you the story, let me tell you the, the rest of the, of the team. Simon Lennon is our third co-PI on, on this. He is a, an expert in uh, building technology. And then Katerina and, and Nicholas are our research associates. And Nicholas actually is a PhD in computer science, and he's the one who actually developed uh, the software under our uh, guidance, obviously. Um, but before I get into that, uh, so basically what happened is that when when Robert was at um, at Autodesk, he, he gave a workshop. And in this workshop that I attended, he talked about something called non-manifold topology. And I'll explain non-manifold topology in a little bit. At that time, I was trying to, to find ways to build really good uh, energy models for energy analysis. And uh, I was struggling with that because, uh, you know, BIM models or 3D models were really not meant to be uh, energy models. So I was, I was thinking about that a lot. And when I saw this non-manifold topology that he spoke about, which he took like five minutes to speak about it, that's all. I mean, it was a very small piece of his presentation, but it kind of caught my eye. So I went back to Design Script and started experimenting with it and built a piece of software quite, quite elaborate to kind of connect uh, Design Script and, and AutoCAD, uh, which had 3D actually, uh, into um, Energy Plus. And we did, we did like a little a bit of an experiment with it and published a paper on it, and that was really fantastic. And then when Autodesk uh, put Design Script in, uh, in Dynamo, because the non-manifold topology was based on ASM, which is a non -open, not open source, not you know, it's just like they need to license it and they pay they pay fees for it. They took the non-manifold stuff out. And if you ever search, if you ever Google my discussions with the with the Dynamo team back from 2013, I believe, uh, you'll see me kind of uh, arguing with them and asking them to bring it back. And uh, they were very nice. They were saying that, you know, I, we, they understand that it is important, uh, but they also thought it was computationally expensive. And, but really behind the scenes, it was mainly a licensing issue. Um, it, they couldn't really uh, keep it in, in the uh, open source or in the kind of available free version of, of Dynamo. 
so I went, so my research kind of like hit a brick wall with that. So I went to uh, Robert, uh, who was, as I said, now a professor at, at the Bartlett, and I said, Robert, let's go ahead and write a proposal and do it our, on our own, and let's write uh, open source software and just simply uh, replace all that functionality and uh, do it properly and add it, not be kind of tied to a commercial uh, entity or a commercial engine. And that's exactly what we did. We wrote a proposal that was reviewed by uh, Chuck Eastman and uh, Arto from Liverpool, and uh, the Liverpool home uh, agreed, and they gave us 300000 to actually do it. That was 2016. So we started building uh, uh, topologic and researching, and there's about 12 papers, I think, about 12 or 13 papers that have been published on this that are on the website if you'd like to see what topologic is about. If you are not uh, familiar with manifold and non-manifold, and my apologies if you are, uh, it's, it's, I don't know usually the audience whether they are familiar with these terms or not, but uh, a, a manifold is really a general term for what is called a two manifolds. Basically, if you imagine this red point on the surface of a cube, it separates the world into uh, two manifolds or two entities or two sets. There is the interior solid of the object and the exterior. And most 3D modeling software uh, is based on manifold uh, topology. Uh, Non-manifold is again a general term where it, the manifolds that it, the point separates are more than two. So three manifold or four manifold or n manifold, the general term for it is non-manifold. So if you imagine a, that red point again, but in this entity now, sitting right on, on that edge, on that ridge, it separates the world into three manifolds. You know, there are the two interiors, of that entity as well as uh, the, the outside world, which is the third entity. So these types of objects are called non-manifolds. And if you have ever done anything with 3D printing uh, or you know, uh, shape healing or whatever it is, they complain a lot about non-manifold, non-manifold edges, non-manifold points. They say that it is kind of an error uh, because you, know, you can have you know, things that do not close correctly or cannot be unfolded into, into a flat plane. Uh, but we we saw uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, advantage for non-manifold topology, uh, and that's why uh, we kind of embarked on this project. Um, we decided to use uh, an engine called Open Cascade, which you are probably very familiar with because it's the same engine as as FreeCAD. And Open Cascade was one of the uh, few, almost the only one we could find that fit our criteria. We, we published a paper reviewing all sorts of engines, closed source and open source. And obviously we wanted to choose an open source engine. And we wanted an engine that can handle non-manifold. And Open Cascade was, I think, the only one uh, that could, could handle it. I think there was one more, but it, it was more limited. So we built Topologic on top of uh, Open Cascade, very much like FreeCAD builds on top of Open Cascade. Uh, but we wanted to have a certain um, clarity and certain uh, methods that were not available uh, directly in, in FreeCAD. And also we wanted to kind of uh, focus on uh, data flow programming. Anyway, so Topologic is good at th these three things that you see on the screen. It's very good at abstraction, it's very good at awareness, and it's very good at speciality. So I will, I will explain those uh, a little bit, what we mean by, by those three concepts. Uh, basically, what we found, and that's what we wrote in the proposal, is that BIM systems focus a lot on what we call the stuff, kind of like the fabric of the building. They do the doors, they do the walls, they do the foundations, they do the piping, the electrical, everything is the stuff of the building. And what gets lost for us as architects is the space, is the sense of space, uh, which is kind of always like, as I said, it's kind of the leftover and it's almost never really fully represented. Now, if you look at something like, like Revit, yes, yeah, they have something called rooms and they have something called conceptual space, but they don't um, force you to actually think about that when you are building. If there are tutorials, if you ever look at a Revit tutorial, the first thing they say is, okay, set your side, do your foundations, start building walls, put the doors. So they push you into the, the kind of uh, generate the building elements, basically, create the building elements. Uh, and they don't care what the space is at the end. And that causes problems, obviously, conceptually, but also causes problems when you are trying to do uh, energy analysis, because then you need, you need actually space and you need topology. You need to know what is next to what. So this is, this is from uh, Revit's uh, very early uh, 
uh, user manual. Maybe they have changed it now. This is from many years back. But what they're telling you is that if you have a, you know, a fully detailed BIM model, as you see here on the left, uh, you know, please go ahead and simplify it by you know, putting you know, these type of simple volumes in order to create an energy model. And what we are trying to do with topology is saying, well, you know, in the early design stages, that's what we have. We have these type of simple uh, zero thickness walls, et cetera, et cetera. So why not use that as a driving type of model? And from that, you can use it as the skeleton, the kind of guide for creating complexity later on. So rather than trying to simplify complexity, why don't you start simply and then build complexity out of a very rigorous model that is at, at the same time very simple to build? Uh, the issue of awareness is what you see here. On, on the left is one of my favorite 3D modeling software, which is 3D Studio Max. This is where I cut my teeth on um, 3D modeling. Uh, and on the right is, is Robert Doe's uh, work with the students with using topology. So if you take one of these cubes in 3D Studio Max and you ask it a very simple question, who is above you? You know, what cube is above you? Who's to your left? Who's to your right? Who's below you? It cannot answer that question. It does not have any idea about the topology. So what we want the topologic to be able to kind of answer these types of topological queries and uh, find what, what, what topologies or geometries, what do they share? Do they share a point? Do they share an edge? Do they share a surface? Do they share a solid? What is the interface between them? He's, he's used it in his kind of modular architecture uh, course or module that he's, he's doing with students to kind of talk about different types of uh, plugins between, between components. Um, so beyond that, kind of more pragmatically, perhaps, uh, topologic is very good at, at topology, uh, meaning how things are uh, adjacent to each other, how they are related to each other. It's good at parametrics as well, of course, you know, because it's part of the kind of workflow. So you can definitely parameterize uh, components and relate them to each other. But it's also very good at semantics. And by semantics, I don't want to, you know, it's not like some kind of big word. Uh, basically information and kind of deriving meaning from these topologies. So we didn't focus on just topologies and the parametrics of it, but we embedded information inside those topologies. And what is, as you'll see later on, this information uh, affects and is affected by Boolean operations. So it's, it, it kind of plays both ways. So it's, it's quite an interesting thing. I hope, I hope you will find it interesting when I explain it. So in terms of the uh, class hierarchy of objects, uh, it's very much what you would see in, in Open Cascade and in FreeCAD in the sense that it goes from all the way from a vertex, two vertices connected make an edge, you know, uh, a, a group of edges makes a wire, a closed wires, or you know, a closed wire, excuse me, makes a face, uh, a group of faces makes a shell. If you close those shells, you can have now a cell, which is the main kind of enclosed volume or space. And then if you have cells that are connected very much like soap bubbles, they have to share faces, you can make a cell complex. Uh, and those are one entities. And then you know, we have something called a cluster, which can be a, a, a kind of a random grouping of any of those lower entities. And all of these are called a topology. So you can kind of like cascade. We can cascade downwards, but we also can, can climb up uh, upwards. So you can ask a vertex for its edges. You can ask a shell for its cell, et cetera, et cetera. And on top of that, we added a few more kind of interesting things to it. We added an aperture. So an aperture is a face that is hosted by another face. So as you can imagine, you can use it for things like doors and windows. We added the idea of content and context, meaning that an object can have contents, very much like a boot of a car, can, you can put stuff in it. But also those the stuff that you have put, they have a relationship to their context. So you can say, this window exists in the context of the wall, but also it exists in the context of the room that it exists in. So it can have multiple contexts. Uh, we added a dictionary, and uh, as I said, this is how we do our um, uh, semantics. So we have a, a, an arbitrary dictionary. You can put any keys and value pairs in it. And we did a graph class, which is based on graph theory, and we can do some kind of uh, space syntax uh, on that.
The, the software architecture is, uh, as I said, it's based on Open Cascade. That's what we call here the NMT geometry kernel. Uh, at that point, we were not um, ready to, to kind of share the name of it at that point. This is a bit of an old slide. On top of that, there is topologic core, which is written in C++. And on top of that, an interface layer, uh, which can be either you know topologic Dynamo or topologic Grasshopper or topologic Net. And then on top of that, we have domain specific software. And one of the ones, the main ones that we have added now is topologic energy. And all of that can be hosted within a visual data flow programming like, like Dynamo or Grasshopper. But also if you use .NET, you can put it in anything else. You can put it in Unity, you can put it in FreeCAD, you can put it in 3ds Max if you, if you are a programmer and know how to do these things. Um, the really important thing is to, to make sure that people understand that topologic is not one thing. Because if I show, it's quite a vast library. It can do a lot of things. And if I show uh, one aspect, people kind of tend to think, oh, okay, so topologic does that. And they go away thinking that's what topologic is for. Like if I show you the fired, fire simulation, you would say, oh, okay, so topologic is used for fire egress and simulations like that. Or if I find, if show you how, you know, you can do space syntax, you say, oh, okay, it's, it's in that. But it's really more than that. It's more like a foundational piece of software and you can build all sorts of domain specific stuff on top of it. So far, this is the list of things that we have been experimenting with. You know, whether it is a kind of just a simple geometry editor, whether it's used for multi-objective optimization, HVAC routing, fire simulation, et cetera, et cetera. And it's been connected to kind of the software that you see uh, on the on the right side, you know, including um, you know uh, the work with Bureau Hubble, which is this large engineering firm. They took topologic and they in included it in their uh, building and habitats object model. So basically, um, just start with the basics. Uh, so what you see here on uh, on th on the right is a cell complex. And that cell complex is made out of cells. So we can pick a random cell in it. Uh, so we pick this cell uh, and it is highlighted in yellow. And then we ask it a very simple question is to give us its adjacent cells. So cell dot adjacent cells. So it gives us, uh, I think, five cells. And those five cells are the one on the left, one on the right, the one above, one below, and then the central core of, of that tower that is obviously adjacent to all the cells. And we say, okay, take those, convert them back into geometries, and then highlight them in a kind of translucent red color. So that's as simple as it is. You can once you have a cell complex, you have all that information about uh, adjacencies, etc. And I can break it into obviously like its component parts. I can also take this cell complex and uh, pick any two cells in it, and ask those two cells what do they share? You know, do you share any faces? and it will highlight them. Here I'm highlighting them in red. So you can see the kind of uh, two translucent ones, the light blue and the yellow, and say, okay, what do you share in terms of faces? And it says, you know, this is the face that is shared between them or uh, vertices or edges. Um, this one is just to kind of show uh, uh, how topology can do uh, energy analysis and to kind of show that it can deal with quite quite complex geometry. You know, usually when you're doing energy analysis, you're doing like boxes. Uh, but here we, we took a what started out as being a curved geometry. We uh, meshed it, we segmented it, we triangulated it. Uh, and what you see here in colors, kind of like these layered colors from red, green, blue, and yellow are the cooling loads of every space. So this is a cell complex that has multiple uh, thermal zones and it has a certain glazing ratio that is represented by those smaller triangles. So you can say, you know, I want a glazing ratio of 30% and uh, you get that. And the data uh, gets exported as GBXML. It goes to Spider, which is kind of like this online viewer for uh, energy models, just to kind of verify that's actually working correctly. Um, I'll, I'll stop for just a second to ask if there are any questions. Good here. Good, all good. Okay, sorry. Just it's so silent sometimes. You wonder if speaking to a screen is really strange sometimes. Um, this one is from a recent paper I did with, excuse me, I did with a PhD student of mine. And what we are trying to do here 
is to use uh, something called graph machine learning, you know, which is part of AI, to recognize a building in an urban context, like on an urban block. So this was like our very, very first foray into uh, graph machine learning. We've done some machine learning before, but kind of like graph machine learning is, is a bit difficult, a bit different. And the idea here is that, can we recognize what a building is just from uh, the dual graph? And the dual graph, if you don't know, is basically taking the centroid of every cell in a cell complex and connecting it to the, its adjacent cells. So you get like a network, right? So that's the dual graph. Uh, so we obviously, Topologic is very good at doing these type of dual graphs. And we did a generative system where we are creating uh, either a tower or a slab, like sort of like a tall building or a low building. And it either sits on a podium or it sits directly onto the ground. And we built these, uh, these uh, thousands of, of graphs and we encoded them into a, into a text file. And then we ran it by, a, by this graph machine learning uh, engine. And we tried to find out whether it can uh, recognize them. So we reached 87% uh, uh, accuracy. So it can, you can just simply have a BIM model of some sort or a simple conceptual model, give the dual graph, and 87% uh, of the time it will tell you what kind of building it is. And that might be good for, uh, for example, recognizing what the neighbors, neighboring buildings are so that you can design something that fits with your context, for example. Um, so this is basically the, the dual graph. Uh, this one is, uh, we are, we're, I started getting interested, started getting interested in uh, graph theory. So I wanted to see whether something is a tree or not, whether it's a binary tree or not. So uh, these are just simply uh, examples of topologic kind of building a cell complex, building the dual graph, and then uh, running some simple Python software to find out whether it's a tree or not. Uh, it can do regular and irregular Boolean operations. So, you know, same thing like union, subtract, and, and intersect, that's fine. But it can also do things like uh, merging or imposing or the exclusive or, uh, and those are, you know, uh, they, they allow for creating non-manifold uh, results. So this is just, ex you know, kind of like exercising it. This is one of our tests to make sure that it is robust uh, when we like, come up with a new version. It's just two entities. And so this is the dual graph. Uh, the dual graph is also a bit more sophisticated in the sense that we don't just connect to uh, centroid to centroid. That's one option. You can also add things like connect through shared faces, connect to the apertures, or connect to the exterior faces. So you can create more advanced uh, dual graphs that allow you to do things like shortest distance and pathfinding. Uh, the content context and custom dictionary is, 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 is interesting here because uh, this building that you see there, this blue, yellow, and, and red, started out as being only made out of three cells. So you can imagine a slab at the bottom, which is blue, not segmented on the inside. Uh, a slab on top of it, which is yellow, which is like uh, offices, and then another big slab on top of it, which is, will end up being residential. Now. You take those three simple prisms and you insert a dictionary into each one of them. You say, okay, the bottom is retail, the, the second le level is, is offices, and then the third level is uh, residential. Okay, so they have these dictionaries. Now you build a cell complex out of it. So this cell complex now has three cells, but each cell has a dictionary, right? So now you can take a bunch of faces or planes and slice it up into smaller pieces. You take that cell complex and you slice it up some more. So it's no longer just three, it's like, I don't know, 100 or 50 or whatever it is. Each new cell that has been created, smaller cell, can figure out automatically on its own where it came from, and then it will inherit that dictionary and it will know that now it is also retail or it's also residential. So I take these, um, uh, these cells, and then I just simply ask them the question, you know, what are you? Where did you come from? And it will say, okay, I am retail or I am I am residential, and I I color code them uh, accordingly. So it's it's interesting that the dictionaries kind of survive Boolean operations is what I would like the point that I'm trying to make. Uh, we also kind of completely resolve the the result of Boolean operations. So what you see here, and this might be very simple as an animation, but what you are seeing here 
is that as this core is, is going through the cell complex, this building, you know, columns and, and beams are being subtracted and added uh, to kind of resolve it. So you'll notice like while it's in the middle, uh, that thing is, is being done because the, the Boolean operation is something called an impose. So the impose means that the thing being imposed uh, stays as is, does not change. And then it gets imposed onto the second topology. Uh, topological awareness is also interesting for kind of like asking questions. So what you will see in this animation here, th this it's very easy to think of this as two entities, but actually the result is one entity. The result is a cell complex. I just removed the, the floor and the ceiling so that you can see it. So what am I what am I doing here? I start with a cell, which is that small square that's moving around, and a cell complex. And then I imp again, I impose that small cell on the cell complex, and the result is a cell complex. But what is happening is that the cells, as I said, they know where they came from, right? So I ask a face in the resulting cell complex. I ask it a very simple question. The first question I ask it is, how many cells do you, are you adjacent to? If the answer is one, that means it's an, it is an external face. So look at all these yellow faces. They are always adjacent to a single cell. So that's fine. I take those apart and I say, okay, those are uh, external walls. So I can apply an external wall material to them. In this case, some, some kind of yellow paint. Then I have the remainder. So those are the cells that are internal. I ask them a second question. I ask them about the cells that they are separating. And if they say, I am between a small cubicle and another small cubicle, I color them in dark blue. And if they say I am between a small cubicle and a large atrium space or some kind of like large reception space, I color those in red. So you'll notice the faces as they are moving through the cell complex are being automatically color coded because they are answering the question differently. Uh, in, a, in a similar way, uh, the cell complex here for the big slab that you see here has cells that have a dictionary in them that has one of two values, either light or dark, or zero and one. And then I impose this blue or whatever it is, this uh, uh, you know axis on it. And then I, I ask this blue axis to give me its adjacent cells. So it gave, gives me a lot of cells that are kind of touching. And then I say, to, I ask each cell, are you light or, or, or dark? You know, are you a zero or a one? And if the answer is light, I color it in bright yellow. So you'll notice that only the lighter colors that used to be kind of like this lighter beige color get highlighted in yellow because they are the ones that ended up being adjacent and, and light colored. This one is based on uh, space syntax. If you, if you know that kind of like a whole line of research uh, traditionally at, at UCL, I think is, is a lot of people doing that. Uh, but basically, this is what do they call uh, space integration or, or vertex integration. If you, if you look closely, there is a dual graph inside the cell complex. You see the wires in there and the, and the nodes, the nodes and the edges. And each of these nodes is measuring its topological distance to, to every other node and computing kind of a score. And the smaller the distance, the smaller the topological distance, the redder the color, and the more the topological distance, the kind of the more cooler the colors. So you can find out which spaces are more central, and maybe that's where you want to put the, the coffee machine or the water cooler or the entrance to the building. And you can find out which spaces are very isolated. You might want to do something to kind of mitigate that. Uh, this one we use topologic with. Um, uh, what they call now generative design, it used to be called uh, project refinery, which is basically just a uh, genetic algorithm that does multi-objective optimization. And what we, the setup we did here is that we have four sides of this building, uh, and and one side, one of the sides could also be kind of one or more of the sides could also be uh, deleted, and we allowed them to kind of start from the edges of the square and then slide against each other, so they can create like either a central courtyard or an H shape or a T shape or a Popeye shape or an L shape or whatever it is. And then we um, we assigned also different glazing ratios. And then we said, okay, give me the configuration that has the highest glazing ratio and the lowest cooling load. So kind of like a two, op two objective uh, optimization problem. And then you can run it from Dynamo into 
uh, project refinery and you can get some kind of results. Uh, this is all running with uh, uh, my topologic energy, which connects to Energy Plus. Uh, we connected it to fire simulation to FDS. Uh, so basically we can take the uh, cell complex, uh, kind of link it to, uh, to FDS and then put a fire in one, one room and kind of observe what happens to the, to the spread of smoke and the temperatures. Uh, but we also uh, connected that back into uh, another branch of AI called uh, reinforcement learning. And in this case, you have a, an agent, which is this uh, yellow cone that is trying, is starts in one room and trying to find the exit. And as it's moving and trying different pathways, uh, the fire is spreading. And this is kind of represented by these uh, red spheres that are kind of increasing in, in size. So this is the animation for it. Uh, at the beginning, obviously, of reinforcement learning, um, you know, it doesn't know what to do, kind of like it's learning from, from doing in a, in a way. So you kind of run, run these types of simulations. But then as the episodes kind of increase, as you can see here in the sliders, it starts to very efficiently find those, uh, those, uh, those exits. We don't tell it that these are fire exits. We don't even tell it where they are or et cetera. It basically, you either uh, punish or reward uh, the agent. And based on that kind of reward and punishment information, it starts learning how to always seek rewards, even if it means punishing on the short term, but kind of like overall long term, it gets rewarded. It's just a, a kind of a Markov decision uh, type of uh, system. Uh, so we did it on a, we tried it on a, uh, one of the example files in Revit. So we started a fire on the second floor. The agent now is this purple cylinder that you see here. And then after a while, after a few episodes, it learns to kind of like duck down, go to the basement and then find one of those green balls. So we put green balls like at the bottom as well as at the top to fool it. So at the beginning, it would like go right through the fire and then it learned to kind of uh, avoid it and go downstairs. <clears throat> uh, this one is finding the shortest path through cool, cooler rooms. So we do an energy analysis. And we, Im we kind of embed that information in the uh, vertices of the dual graph. And then you can find the coolest or the shortest distance through the coolest rooms. So you can compute that as a cost almost. So we do shortest path things uh, with the graph. Uh, this one, we combined it with uh, something called the visibility graph. So we're trying to find shortest distances in an intelligent way. Uh, so as you... Uh, design these types of towers, let's say, going through an office building, and you're trying to find the shortest distance from the green ball to the red ball. It is try it, it decides which tower to take to take up, you know, up to the to the third floor or fourth floor. And the graph is being computed at every time, kind of like the circulation graph. So rather than putting like a big uh, 3D matrix or lattice of of lines, which is very heavy, it creates a visibility graph and combines it with a vertical graph into a fully three-dimensional graph that can now we can do shortest distance or pathfinding on. Uh, this one, uh, I'm, I'm going to kind of speed through it a little bit. But basically, again, it uses kind of the semantics. So you can set up a system where you can tell Topologic what to do if it recognizes a certain situation. So in this game, probably some of, you know, probably most of you know about the rock, paper, scissor game. And, you know, they, somebody has extended it to include Spock and Lizard. Uh, but basically, the arrows show which one kind of wins in a, in a confrontation. Like when you combine scissors with paper, the scissors win. And paper with rock, paper wraps rock, and the paper wins. So you can set up this type of um, uh, kind of what happens at the intersection of certain uh, elements. So I took that idea and I said, okay, let me see uh, if I can implement that idea and implement a kind of a semantic system behind it. So if you color code these things and then convert them into a matrix, you can put one on the columns, one on the, on the rows, and you can then say in the matrix what happens. So if you kind of trace your eyes on, let's say, paper and scissors, you'll find out that the scissors win. And if it is scissors and rock, the rock wins, right? So you can take this type of matrix and you can convert it into numbers, you know, from you know zero to four, 
And uh, then you can represent it as a three-dimensional entity. So the, the only way I could do it like very quickly, because I didn't have a lot of time for it, is I thought about this, this the graph that I saw, this diagram that I saw. I thought, okay, I'll make these five towers and I'll color code them the same way. And from every tower, I'm gonna do these pedestrian bridges, kind of like tentacles that go and intersect with the other towers. So every one of them goes and, and intersects with, with all the other ones, and they are like at different heights. So if you do the intersection of this, so I built this in, in Dynamo and imb imbued it with dictionaries. So basically this, the colors are now dictionaries. So you see here the dictionary is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And if you do all the intersections, uh, so if you do an intersection of two entities that have a dictionary and have that dictionary has the same ID, the resulting intersection will store the identities of the parents. So if I had A intersecting B, that intersection will have an, a dictionary that has the ID A comma B. So it will know where it came from. And if you take that and you intersect it with C, the result will be A, B, C. So it will always remember its kind of lineage, its heritage, where it, where, where it came from. So now that I have these intersections, and it's very easy for me to write a small Python script to uh, with the rules about which one wins. So if it is a an intersection that is A, B, maybe A wins. And if it is a B, C, maybe C wins. So you can write these rules very easily, but now you have the information to, to make that decision. So you'll notice that um, in the list here that you see, it's a, there's, a, there's a dictionary that has 0 and 1, 0 and 1, 0 and 2, 0 and 2, 0 and 3, et cetera. So there are these types, two, two uh, values for, for those keys are, are being stored. So you can color code them now correctly so you can see what, what the uh, results uh, should be. And you'll notice that it is exactly the same as that initial table that I showed you in terms of which, which wins basically when you intersect one entity with another entity. So they're all consistent. Now, if obviously this we did this with uh, rock paper scissors Spock lizard, but if you can think of, of it as private, public, semi-private service and access, and you can change the rules of the game, you can say which one wins. So access, let's say, always wins because you always need access. Let's say, uh, you know, public with public is public, semi-private with private, private wins, etc. You can decide. You can decide on this exactly as as you wish it to be, and then you can just change this and then obviously convert it into numbers and then run it again to the same definition, but just simply changing the rules at the end, you'll notice how, how it all uh, changes colors. Um, we did uh, 3D pathfinding for Revit because Revit recently uh, announced uh, kind of pathfinding, but it only works in 2D. So if you have like stairs, it doesn't work. So we, I decided as a challenge to do uh, 3D pathfinding uh, from a Revit model, and basically it's all based on semantics. So I don't build a cell complex here. Basically, I take a look at every door, and I say, okay, which are the two spaces, and then I build my graph based on that. But also, I made it climb stairs very, very well. So it, it, I look at the geometry of the of the stairs. I take a look at the horizontal faces. You know, normal pointing upwards. Build build the points and make it climb stairs. Very much like what you would do for robot pathfinding. And this is more recently, I tweeted about it. Uh, this is about congestion. So we are starting to work on uh, post-COVID-19 kind of return to work, like many, many people are doing, but at least we're doing it you know, based on research uh, rather than just white papers and kind of videos. Uh, so we're, we're trying to use topologic for that. Uh, so this is a plan that, uh, again, uh, was imported into topologic, and then uh, we made a... Um, graph out of it and then uh, basically this is a space syntax measure it's called uh, choice but we are calling it uh, congestion and basically it, it, it counts how many times a, um, a vertex is uh, kind of traversed when you are doing uh, shortest path between between certain points so you can tell where the uh, bottlenecks are <clears throat> so just to end Topologic, what, what we think about it is kind of a, a very lightweight but rigorous model that can be the driver or the skeleton or the guideline for more complex uh, 
uh, derived models like a building fabric model or an energy analysis model or a structural analysis model or a spatial reasoning model. Thank you, guys. Thank you. That was really interesting. Thanks. Any questions, comments? Yeah, I've got one. Um, so at the moment you've, uh, oh, this is just my personal interest, I guess. Uh, I can clearly see a, a lot of use for topologic. Um, when you create the shapes, is that just uh, with any arbitrary um, set of manifold volumes at the beginning, you can feed into it and then it will uh, detect from that if two manifold topologies have a shared face, they, they join together to create a non-manifold uh, cell complex. Is that how it works? Is What, what are the restrictions on initial modeling? Uh, yeah, no, initial modeling can be anything. Uh, basically, you take uh, two entities or multiple entities. So you, we have things called, for example, uh, cell complex by cells. So basically, you can take uh, cubes. If they are touching, you know, if their faces are touching, let's say you make like a grid of them, three-dimensional grid, and you make them into topology. So now they are like just a list of cells. And then you say cell complex by cells. You give it this whole list. It will build you a cell complex. Uh, you can build cell complex by faces, so or you can slice. So, for example, you can take a cube and then a list of faces that are, let's say, representing the floors or the floors and the walls, whatever you want. And then you take that whole list and the cell, the big kind of building envelope, and they say, slice this building envelope with these faces. So it's a slice operation. And you get a cell complex at the end. Um, you can take two things and merge them, subtract them. I mean, you know, it's normal Boolean operations, but fully, um, uh, fully non-manifold. And if you start off with a non-manifold shape, it, it can upset that as well. If you have a way to create it from the beginning, yes. But more, I mean, in FreeCAD you can. Like for example, you can model something. And I assume everybody is very familiar with FreeCAD, correct? Like it's, uh, it's, is that correct? Yeah, I think most in this call have used it. Yeah, yeah, I think so. So in FreeCAD, you can uh, you can save to a B wrap. Like so, you can model anything you want in FreeCAD. Save it to a B wrap, and then load it into Dynamo, into Topologic. So the, the Topologic has something called Topology by by imported B wrap. So if you can if you can create non manifold from the beginning in something like FreeCAD, which is one of the few that can do non manifold. Uh, you can just bring it right into Topologic. And anything in Topologic that you do, you can export to a BRAP and load it up in FreeCAD and continue right. working on it, modeling it you know, normally in FreeCAD. So um, <clears throat> that, that's pretty cool because you're, you're right, absolutely, FreeCAD can do that. Um, Blender can also do that, which is something I'm looking to integrate with. Um, do you provide uh, some sort of cross platform uh, sort of bindings uh, is I saw there that you you did import topologic uh, in, a, in a Python script is is that something that's available cross platform yeah uh, I mean do you, I don't I mean I don't know do you, do you want me to uh, show it to you live a little bit maybe that'll give people a bit more realistic uh, idea about how it works uh, yeah I don't mind unless somebody else wants to ask some questions and I'm just asking many. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Yeah, I mean, uh, just guys, just jump in if you have any questions. Maybe if you start seeing it in kind of like in action. Um, so this is now, I mean, my the main way I run it is in um, Dynamo, but uh, it can run it can run in Grasshopper. It is it has a .NET. So you can, as I said, you can, uh, if you know what you're doing, I don't, I don't really, I'm not uh, that technical, uh, but you can take the .NET and try to uh, load it into something like FreeCAD or something else that, you know, or, or even Blender or Unity or something like that. Um, and more recently, I'm not ready, it's not ready yet, uh, but we are trying to make it run on Linux. And uh, I'm working with Hypar, with Ian Keel's high part to try to, to get it to Linux. 
it ran through Grasshopper. So, so I don't know if you know about Hyper. Look it up if you know Hyper.io. Uh, but yes. recently, they took a Grasshopper, and if you have a definition in Grasshopper, it can run on their web server. So I asked them. I said, "Okay, so can we can we test Topologic?" And they said, "Well, we need to install the Topologic plugin, which they were able to do, and uh, kind of not officially supported." But a, a definition that uses Topologic was able to run on Hyper, and I could see the results on their web server. So that's prom very promising. But they are very hesitant to support it officially because they pay like per gigabyte and per megabyte, and they pay per minute. And you know, like it's a web server, so they're worried about loading that service with a lot of plugins at this point. So they need to kind of monetize this in some way. So they they don't know what how you know what's going to happen with that, um, but this one, uh, this is from uh, Testfit. Um, do you guys know Testfit? Testfit.io. Uh, yep. Yep. Yeah? Okay. Great. Uh, so I've been working with with Clifton uh, on on this for, for Clifton Clifton Harness for 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 a while on this, uh, and stopped it for a while, and now I came back to it uh, because we're trying to get this into Revit. Uh, so the idea here is that uh, I have they have something called an RSD file. Not sure what RSD stands for, but it's basically a text file that has 2D geometry. So basically, they do like a trick. It's basically 2D, two and a half D. Everything is uh, kind of two-dimensional polygons and then a height. And it's up to you to kind of build the 3D geometry. They don't actually have 3D geometry in the file. So I wrote a, cust a, a custom node. Um, that I'm trying to open right now. It's going to take a while, probably. It's a big note. Here it is. Um, that reads the kind of the entities. And he has these things called amenity, balcony, common, garage, lift, stairs, unit, etc. And then, so these are 2D uh, polycurves. Okay, so I take those. And let me show you sort of like an example of that. Let's say, let's take the units, which are the apartments kind of. And from the file, I can get the floor height. So everything has the same floor height and you can just simply multiply if you want you know, more floor heights. So this is a dynamo no node. So curve.extrude as solid, this is, this is not topologic. And then, I say topology by geometry here. So basically, I am taking, try, let me try to remember here. So this solid is being done as a topology by geometry. So this becomes a cell right here. And then I scale it if it is in feet, basically, that's a 0 0.3. And then I imbue it with a dictionary. So I created a dictionary. Uh, this is where topologic kind of becomes uh, important or, or you know useful here because i create a dictionary uh, and its id name and this is unit because i know this is a unit that i'm getting in and then i take that cell that has resulted from this conversion and i embed a dictionary in it and i do that for everything else so everybody everything has a different cell you know this is unallocated etc so at the end i take all of these cells and I build a, a cluster. So this is, again, a topologic thing, because I don't know whether it's going to build a cell complex or not. Cell complexes are really difficult to build. You know, If you don't have the geometry and the kind of uh, floating point accuracy, they can fail very easily. But a cluster is just simply an, a kind of a collection of, of cells. So I build a cluster, and I, I return it. So now that I have returned this cluster, I can ask the cells. Uh, for their dictionaries. I'm just going back to the main uh, definition now. So I got the cluster here. That's the topologic cluster. I get the cells. I have 74 cells. And then I say, give me the dictionaries for, for the key that's called ID. So I get those 74 uh, you know, IDs. And then I assign colors based on those IDs. So now I know which one is a, an apartment, which one is the corridor, which one is the lift, which one is the staircase. Um, but just going back to your uh, original question of 
how do I, you know, how do I do this? So if I say, just make a cuboid by length, by making it 10 by 10 by 10. Oops, sorry, one more. And if I uh, translate this, and if I say from zero to 10 by 10, so this gives me a list of uh, three numbers, I believe. And I do cross product, which is a bad name for it. It should be cross lacing. Uh, but basically, this is a grid of uh, four four cubes. So I'm just going to hide those completely. So I have now these four uh, cuboids. I'm going to flatten this list because it's uh, kind of a nested list at this point and hide this as well. So now this is a four cuboids, but they are sharing surfaces. So I can say topology by geometry. Oops, sorry. Topology dot uh, by geometry. So now this became a list of four cells. Now I can say uh, cell complex dot uh, by cells. And now I have a, a cell complex. So if I say uh, topology dot edges, it's giving me the edges of, of the cell complex. And then topology dot geometry to draw it. Top topologic on purpose doesn't draw anything to the screen. We, we don't want to like make it very heavy. So you can do all your uh, uh, computations without drawing anything to the screen. If you want to see anything onto the screen, you simply say topology dot geometry. This also encapsulates kind of like uh, the the geometry translation. So if you ever use something else like FreeCAD or or 3D Studio Max or Unity, it's all you only you have to write two methods: topology by geometry and topology dot geometry. So like the the entrance and the exit. Uh, so these are uh, non overlapping unique edges from from the cell complex. And if I say uh, internal boundaries, I believe it's called. Let me see which one it is. This is the cell face uh, cell complex, internal boundaries. And I say topology dot geometry. I get the, uh, the internal walls. Again, uh, split and kind of unique. Um, so this is the, the, you know, the, the kind of stuff, but I can, I can take these uh, internal boundaries, these faces, and I say uh, topology.cells, like give me the cells that created this face, and it should work. Let's see. So you'll notice that they all have two cells because you know this face has these two cells, this face has these two cells. So you can kind of like um, climb up the tree again. Um, just another question. I know your approach at the beginning was kind of the opposite of what most people do, which is that you start with the with the cells and then you use that to derive the more complex geometry, whereas most people try to do the other way around. Um, have you tried to do it the other way around simply because <laughs> that is how a lot of people uh, work? This is yeah, this is the the most popular question we get. Uh, Robert H would have had a very good answer to, uh, for you on, on that one because it kind of like irks him a lot uh, when people ask that. But he, yes, we from the beginning, from the time that we wrote the proposal, we knew that we were going to get that question because this is what people are doing. They're, they're, they have uh, Revit models, they have complex models, and they want to uh, simplify them, rationalize them, and make these types of kind of uh, queries out of them. Uh, we've done it on many, many occasions. Uh, but what it needs is what Bureau Happold would call a model laundry, meaning you somehow need to go through a phase where you are cleaning up your geometry. Without that, our hands are tied. We're not magicians. I mean, we can't yeah, take something that to model badly and kind of do. With the test fit stuff, uh, test fit, if you notice the model from test fit, 
it is uh, very, very compatible with how we create it. They don't create thickened walls. They don't create like uh, the actual risers and the steps of a staircase. It's all uh, abstracted. So when I saw the models that we were creating, I thought, ah, that's very topologic-like. But even their models, what happened is that because they write it out to a text file and they are writing uh, doubles as floats, so they only have, uh, I think, six or eight uh, decimal points, something that's supposed to be 24 ends up being 23.99889, something like that. And that is giving us trouble uh, simply because of the floating point errors. Yeah. So we're trying to do kind of uh, workflows that clean up that geometry and snap things correctly, et cetera. But you'll, never, you'll always be in what I call like quicksand with this because you are not, you are going from complexity trying to simplify. And it's much harder to do that than try to do something simple and then take these and say, these, I know that this is the center face of an interior wall. So I can do it as a center line and I can thicken it and build a wall on it. And the ones that are exterior, I can do an offset to the inside. So because I, because I have that semantic information, I know what, what, what I'm dealing with. So it's much easier to build complexity. Sorry, yeah. Uh, so I'm, we're trying, I mean, in the proposal, we said we want to try to change people's minds about how to do this. We want to change practice, basically. Uh, another question. Um, in terms of integration with things like IFC, uh, IFC has very similar concepts. In well, it, it has a space, for example. Uh, it also has groupings of spaces. Uh, it also has space boundaries um, or inset boundaries, which are often used in energy analysis. Have you tried integrating with that? Uh, no, we have not. Uh, not ourselves. The, 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 pers the best person to talk to about this uh, would be uh, Michael de Gunziak, who was with Pure Hubble and worked with us. Pure Hubble were, were uh, one of our industrial partners. But then he left, and then he's now in Bristol working for a company called Horlia. And uh, they have uh, written something called SAM, which, they, which integrates uh, topologic in it and uh, creates these types of entities. Uh, I don't believe they are dealing with IFC directly, but I know they are. Uh, BOM was something that you could input all sorts of things into it, including IFC. Um, we have not had the time to look at it, uh, but I think it would be quite quite a good um, uh, way forward for us. The only time we tried IFC, and it unfortunately failed, we published a paper on it. Uh, this was a few years back, so it might, things might have improved a little bit. Uh, but we were trying uh, IFC as an export rather than GBXML, and it failed miserably on us. And I think it's not the fault of IFC. I think just the implementations that we were testing were just simply subpar. Um, I don't know if the situation has, has improved. Oh, has it? Because I, <laughs> I tried a, a couple months ago or so, and I had some issues with getting IFC into energy analysis software. Yeah, I mean, my, my understanding is that the big commercial companies like, like Autodesk and stuff are not really interested in making IFC work very well. So they kind of say, oh, we, we support it, we do it. But but behind the scenes, it kind of like the devil is in the details. There's going to be a lot of stuff that yeah. it fails. Uh, but GBXML for us has been quite robust and uh, you know a good way into uh, energy analysis. But it's, uh, I don't know, is, is GBXML considered free and open source or is it not accepted? I don't know. I, I believe it, it. It is an open spec, and uh, and I have uh, written stuff for it. I, oh. I don't see any reason why it isn't an open standard. Yeah, I mean, for for, for us, you can you can if you build an energy model uh, from from topologic. I mean, we have something called topologic energy. Uh, you can uh, export uh, to DBXML, and it, it it just will export it because we are using uh, Open Studio uh, and that's Open Studio. Yep. So it's, it buys us all of that. I don't have any more questions. Anybody okay. else? It's a very quiet group. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, can, I can make a question. I mean, uh, I'm not 
into these uh, things so much, but I just want to ask uh, if, for example, there is an external space in a building, I don't know if you have balconies or something, how would you represent them? Uh, let's say it would be still a cell or would it be something different? Right. So it would be a, uh, right. Depending on the configuration, we definitely can represent it. So if it is, let's say, uh, a set of faces where some of them uh, kind of do a like an interior room and the other one is a balcony and like let's say an enclosed balcony but it's open on one side uh, this will be a shell i believe uh, it might be a cluster uh, if it is separated uh, but mostly i think it would be a shell uh, the moment you close it it will become a cell complex like if you take one surface and you just simply plug it in uh, and then all of a sudden the balcony is an enclosed space and the room, you know, the, the building is an enclosed space. It becomes a cell complex. It can detect these things and it will do them. It will give you the, the correct um, topology type uh, for it. And you can ask, there is something called topology.type. So you can ask what, what you are getting and make decisions based on, on the type. Okay, thank you. Uh, you can also have things like floating in the mid, mid air i mean you can you know the you know the cluster can, can you can have like uh, wings coming out of the of the object and stuff like that um, if you've worked with freecad it, it it does very very similar things it's it, underneath it's all b-wrap so uh, it's very similar to that if there are no other questions what i'm what i will ask is you know, and I, I, you know, you don't need to to reply now. But what I am looking for is is partners to actually, you know, make sure that this is available for more platforms. So if you have a platform, especially FreeCAD, I'm really interested in in bringing this back to FreeCAD because a lot of the prototyping work when we were developing the software, I would do in FreeCAD, and then I bring to the team and say, look, this is what FreeCAD can do. We should do that in, in topology because it's based on the same engine and we learned a lot uh, from it. So if there is anybody who's an expert in how you can load the .NET DLL into FreeCAD and kind of make a uh, workbench and uh, and offer uh, you know topologic on FreeCAD, I would be absolutely delighted to work with you guys on, on that. Uh, but obviously this is also on GitHub and available so you can download and try to build it from, from the software itself. I think we can try that. I think the guys, uh, the main developers who are working on FreeCAD, like uh, Yorick or Bernd, um, they're not currently on the call, but they will definitely see this recording. Um, I, I think the first steps is getting the core libraries built on Linux, um, because if it's just if it's not working cross-platform, in, in general, uh, yeah. we, we can't use it, because we need to distribute for all three platforms. Yeah. Um, and the issue with .NET is that people say it's portable, but it's not really. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it, the C++ side of it is a lot easier to make portable than the .NET side of things. .NET is still very much uh, Microsoft-centric, uh, dis despite uh, what, it, what it says in the box. So yeah. getting these, uh, ideally the C++ side of it compiled uh, and, and making the .NET at least separate uh, is the first step. And then if there can be some Python bindings, that immediately opens up uh, the the group of people who can develop on it uh, to a much larger set. Mm -hmm. And then, as you say, all you need to really implement is the input and output uh, geometry. And uh, you could probably instantly plug it into multiple platforms. Uh, yes, including FreeCAD, uh, also including uh, Blender, yeah. but then also including uh, individual utilities. So for example, um, if, for example, we have a utility which takes IFCs and converts to and from uh, Codaster for structural analysis, uh, we could do the same with this for building energy analysis with to and from IFC and GBXML. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. so I, absolutely. those are the steps. I think uh, first is to try and get the uh, to reduce the .NET as much as possible. Um, mm -hmm. uh, get the C plus plus compiled on Linux, and then ideally provide some Python bindings. 
Yeah, so we we have already started this. So we have uh, we've done a couple of those steps. Uh, we have now a version that has been built from scratch that is purely uh, uh, OCCT topologic core topologic net on top of that. So that's you know so OCCT built in in a very you know clean way and then uh, topologic core in C++ on it, and then topologic net separate on it. So you can, you can stop at the, at the topologic core and use that. Um, and we have now contacted the developer again to see if, we can, if he can help us build it for Linux from, from scratch. So we're building it with, uh, I think it's .NET, .NET Core, which is supposed to be portable. Uh, and can build for for Linux, but that's for the for the C sharp uh, portion of it. Yeah. Um, so hopefully we will have something. Uh, we unfortunately we are uh, we're quickly running out of resources because the project has has finished. So soon this will be just completely up to the open source community. If somebody wants to get onto GitHub, download it, and start, you know, uh, hacking it and and doing pull requests and stuff. Um, otherwise, we're really we're running out of resources to to continue working on it. Yep. All right. So that's. that's <laughs> oh, that's 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 great. That some progress has been made. Hopefully, it continues because um, that that would that would definitely open up the doors to a lot more people who can use it once it's it's truly cross cross platform. For sure. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, guys, okay. thank you very much for, for listening in on this. Uh, and um, I'm very happy to answer any more questions. If you want to email me, uh, contact me. Or if you want to follow what uh, what Topologic is about, I'm on Twitter, Topologic BIM. And I'm on LinkedIn under my own name. So if, if you'd like, just follow those. You'll see a lot of uh, activity. I'm usually like posting something at least once a week. And uh, best wishes with everything, guys. Thanks very much, Wasim. Thanks, thank guys. You. Th thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye bye. Bye. Guys, is there, is there anything else that we're going to talk now? <laughs> I think we've all left. <laughs> okay. okay, yeah, that's good. That's good. Okay, we had uh, a nice presentation, so we can uh, finish off, finish it off here. I don't know if there is anything else that you want to say, Dion. Uh, no, no. Um, I think there's some good progress being made and. Both the FreeCAD world and the Blender BIM world and Archipack as well. So, just keep on working, keep on building. Okay, okay, and then uh, we will have uh, new updates maybe September, October, and the new meetups. Yep. That's good. Okay. See you around. Bye bye. Bye bye.